The final segment of our course deals with two-plane dynamic balancing by the single-plane vector diagram method. You will find that the majority of your dynamic balancing will be in the two-plane class. As you may recall from the introduction to this course, two-plane balancing of the type we will be showing you is not really much different than single-plane balancing. In fact, the calculations, measurements, and formulas are identical to those you've already learned. In short, you will simply learn to apply the vector diagram method to a two-plane situation. The only real difference is that you must take the cross effect into account. This is the piece of equipment we'll be using in this segment to demonstrate the procedures for two-plane balancing. It's a rotor which has been removed from an electric motor. As with our other rotor, we have installed this piece of equipment in a carrier for ease of demonstration. It has already been checked for straight, and the bearing journals have been measured to ensure that they are not out of round. Once it was secured in the carrier bearings, we coupled it to a driver, as shown here. It is now ready for the balancing operation. The next step is to assemble the vibration analyzer with the required accessories. As you can see, it is the same instrument that we use during single plane balancing. The only difference is that we'll be checking for unbalance in two planes instead of one. This means that we will need two vibration pickups, as shown here. They are both connected to a junction box. The box is then connected to the analyzer with this cord. The junction box does not allow simultaneous readings of both pickups at once. It is intended only for your convenience, allowing you to switch back and forth from one probe to the other with this switch. The box therefore eliminates the necessity of disconnecting and reconnecting each probe to take readings on the opposite bearing. The stroboscopic light you see is the same as that used during single plane balancing. Only one is required. After the analyzer is assembled properly as shown, Refer to your manufacturer's manual for the test, which should be completed to check your instrument for proper operation. When you have finished the test, attach one of the pickup probes to each of the two bearing brackets on the carrier. They're being attached in a horizontal position, since this will enable us to record the greatest possible displacement during our checks. Make sure they are tightly secured to prevent additional vibration. Now use a paint stick to make reference marks on each of the two planes to be checked. In other words, one on each end of the rotor. Make sure they are clearly visible. The next step will be to check the level of vibration in each end of the rotor. However, here's something you must remember. This graphic illustration shows our motor rotor mounted in the carrier. The letters A and B represent the two planes we will be balancing. X and Y stand for the two bearings which support the rotor. In this situation, you would measure the vibration from plane A through the pickup attached to bearing Y, and the unbalance in plane B would be measured through the pickup attached to bearing X. In short, you would measure the vibration for the plane in the nearest bearing housing. However, this illustration shows a situation that is also quite common. This is called an overhung rotor. As you can see, the entire rotor extends from one end of the shaft, supported by bearings Y and X. In this case, you would monitor the vibration from plane A through the pickup attached to bearing Y, the closest bearing. However, the unbalance in plane B would be picked up at bearing X. 
Remember this in case you encounter a similar situation. There are also other unusual situations you'll encounter in two-plane balancing, in addition to what we've shown you here. Since it's impossible to cover all of the possibilities, we've selected the two examples which will illustrate the majority of the unbalanced situations you'll come in contact with. The next step in our two-plane balancing problem is to start the driver and bring the rotor up to operating speed. When it is stabilized, turn the filter out on the analyzer and measure the amplitude of the vibration on one of the bearings. Adjust the instrument until the displacement registers in the upper two-thirds of the scale. Once you have an accurate reading, use the junction box to switch to the pickup on the opposite bearing. Compare the reading from the second bearing to that from the first bearing. Select the bearing that is emitting the highest displacement, according to the readings just taken. The end generating the most vibration must be balanced first. Since this is a suspended rotor, the highest reading came from this plane of the rotor, since it is closest to the bearing the reading was taken from. Next, turn the filter back in on your analyzer, and determine the frequency at which the rotor is turning. As you may recall, this may be done with the needle on the amplitude meter, as being pointed out here. Or by using the strobe and the oscillator to freeze the reference mark. From this point on, you simply balance this plane of the rotor using the same methods you were shown for single plane balancing. You may not be able to eliminate as much of the unbalance as would be expected. Remember, though, that much of the remaining vibration may be generated through cross-effect from the other end of the rotor. Once you have removed the majority of the unbalance from the first end of the rotor, switch to the pickup on the second end of the assembly. As before, engage the strobe light and locate the reference mark. Tune the analyzer until the mark is frozen in place by the light. Complete the balancing of the second end of the rotor using the single plane vector diagram method. Don't forget that the remaining vibration on this end may be caused in part by cross effect from end number one. Although you removed most of the unbalance present there, there will be some remaining vibration which would be transmitted back to this end through cross-effect. The next step will be to switch back to the pickup at the first end of the rotor and check it again for any remaining unbalance. If the vibration that still remains is not within acceptable limits, it will be necessary to rebalance each end of the rotor until the required corrections are made. Here's a very important point to remember. Approach the remaining unbalance on each end of the rotor as a completely new unbalance problem. Construct a completely new vector diagram for each end, disregarding the diagrams you used for the first phase of balancing. However, the balance weights installed during the first attempts should be left in place. Simply add the new weights where your calculations call for them. Continue the process until the balance in both planes of the rotor is within acceptable limits. That's the basic procedure to be followed in most common two-plane dynamic balancing. Needless to say, there will be variations and problems which are peculiar only to a certain piece of equipment. For these, it may be necessary to consult your supervisor or a specialist at your plant for advice on the procedure to be followed. Once you've become familiar with single and two-plane balancing, you will undoubtedly be expected to go into multi-plane balancing. This is an advanced type of balancing that requires a great deal of experience and application of knowledge that you have acquired through the simpler forms of balancing. 
There are a number of references in your workbook which can be of tremendous help in your skills lab sessions. For instance, one reference is designed to assist you in determining whether a rotor should be balanced in one or two planes. Another reference contains detailed instructions on situations where you are unable to install a correct weight where the formula says you should. In short, you have to divide the weight between adjacent points on the rotor. The reference gives you details on how this is done. There are also references which break the unbalancing procedures down into a step-by-step -step process. Examples are included with these instructions. If you have any difficulty with them, ask your instructor. He'll be glad to help. Dynamic balancing is a highly specialized field. It was created because the equipment we work with is not perfect, and probably never will be. For this reason, it is necessary to compensate for the faults, flaws, mistakes, and other problems encountered in rotating equipment. Dynamic balancing is a highly complex field. You will be encountering new problems in it for years to come. But those years will supply you with the experience you need. Completion of this training module does not make you an expert. It was simply intended to supply you with the basic knowledge required to get you started in dynamic balancing. We have some questions for you now in exercise number four of your workbook.